Hey everybody, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our weekly lecture. I wanna thank our sponsor, Patrick Wheeler. Sponsors a lot of lectures. If you'd like to sponsor a lecture, contact my wife, Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com and you can sponsor a lecture. Today's lecture is on the Queen's Indian Defense and this is an opening that's not as popular as it was in the 80s and 90s, but there was a famous Queen's Indian Defense game played last week, um, which I'm not gonna show since I've already done a video on it. And that was the game Magnus Carlsen lost. Um, now, the, the sponsor didn't say whether uh, he wanted to look at it from anybody's point of view. So we're gonna see games that white won and black won. Um, and maybe in some cases I won't show the whole game because that's not part of the Queen's Indian defense, but at least one of the games I will because the game's so good. So the Queen's Indian starts, the Wikipedia articles actually has a lot of information. Uh, this is the starting position of the Queen's Indian. And uh, if white doesn't want to face the Queen's Indian and white wants to play d4 and c4, then as they point out, you can play the Nimzo Indian where white plays knight c3 and, instead of knight f3. And it doesn't point out that you can play the Catalan with g3 on move three instead of knight f3. And g3, the Catalan, and knight c3, the Nimzo Indian, if black plays bishop b4, uh, stop black from playing the Queen's Indian. Uh, typically, in the last 15 years or so, the super GMs have been playing d5 on move three. So we're not seeing a lot of Queen's Indians anymore. Okay, the main line is with g3, and we have at least one game in that line uh, where black can either fianchetto his bishop with bishop b7 or play bishop a6, which I'm gonna go over when I get to the board. Um, a3 is called the Petrosian variation, and funnily enough, it was picked up by Kasparov, and he played it a lot um, with devastating results. And bishop f4, which we're not gonna look at, is the Miles variation. Nobody plays that except me. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, I played bishop f4. Um, basically, because I didn't want to play theory, and uh, I saw a nice game Miles won against Belyovsky, uh, oh, I don't know, 35 years ago, maybe. Maybe. Okay, and then they have the ECO codes, which don't matter anymore. They used to matter. Um, yeah, there's some books on the Queen's Indian you can buy if uh, you, know, you want more information about the Queen's Indian. But basically, uh, we need to take this lecture and go back to 1985 when like every game was a Queen's Indian. And now no, nobody plays the Queen's Indian. And when they do, they lose. No, uh, I'm just saying that because Carlson lost to a 2,500 last week playing the Queen's Indian, which wasn't the fault of the opening. So, okay. Uh, the, the, the two most famous games that I know, and your mileage may vary and other grandmasters may disagree in the, in the Queen's Indian are from Kasparov when Kasparov was becoming and was world champion. Uh, and this is a famous match for a couple of reasons. This is his candidates match with Korshnoi. So what happened was in 1983, Korshnoi was supposed to play Kasparov in Pasadena, California in a candidates match. And uh, Kasparov and the Soviet Chess Federation said, no, we're not, we're not going to America to play a candidates match. And Fide said, yes, you are. Um, so the match took place. The, the arbiter was Koltanowski, which is funny because he's a, he was a GM who had, he was an interest, I could, I could do a lecture on Koltanowski. He was a very interesting man. But anyway, uh, so game one, uh, Korshnoi showed up and Kasparov didn't. And Korshnoi won on forfeit. And instead of winning games on forfeit, since Kasparov wasn't gonna show up, they just stopped the match and said Korshnoi wins. Now, why do I know this? Because at the exact same time as the candidates match in Pasadena, I was in Pasadena for the US Open. And since uh, Korshnoi was there and his match didn't take place, 
he took a round one bye in the U.S. Open and played in the U.S. Open because he was there. And Yasser Sarawan was his second, as Yasser has been in the 80s and 90s. Yasser was frequently Korshnoi's second. And Yasser did the same thing. So Yasser and Korshnoi all of a sudden were playing in the U.S. Open. And I was rated like 2100, so I wasn't like, you know, going to do well. But in fact, I, I did poorly. Um, so anyway, uh, then FIDE decided, all right, you're not forfeited. We'll play in London next year. And in 1984, they played in London. And so that match in Pasadena like didn't count. Even though Korshner was declared the winner, then they just said, ah, okay, that match didn't take place. Let's actually play a match. And Korshner agreed. And this was game one. And Kasparov was very famous against the Queens Indian for playing the move A3. And he played knight C3 and then A3. But typically Kasparov played A3 and then knight C3. I don't know why he played knight C3 first this game. And I mean, this is a candidates match. So, you know, this game is going to be very interesting. Now, another very interesting game between Kasparov and Korshnoi was the first time they ever played each other in a slow tournament at the Olympiad where Korshnoi was white and it was a Benoni and Kasparov sacrificed all of his pieces and ended up winning when Korshnoi blundered in time trouble. That's a very famous game too. And this is the first game they've played in a candidates match and this game is famous, but I won't tell you why yet because it's actually famous because of the the game itself, not because this is the first time they played a candidates match, but this game is the one from the match that I remember. Okay, Korshnoi played d5. Now, we have to talk about the Queen's Indian for a second. If, if white plays knight to c3, um, black isn't playing b6 because white can play e4. N no, nobody is doing that. Okay, and typically black plays bishop b4, and this is the Nimzo Indian, that would be a different lecture. Or black could play d5, and that's the queen's gambit declined by transposition, and this is my chessable course that's already out, discusses this position in detail. Okay, and if typically people who play knight f3 don't want to allow the Nimzo Indian. And then there are people like Kramnik and many others who want to play the Catalan, so they play g3. Now, you don't play b6 because white plays bishop g2 and black doesn't really want to play d5 because, you know, this is going to be, whoa, because this is going to be a major pin for a lot of the game. And even if black played bishop b7, his pawn is still pinned. So typically after g3, black plays the move d5 and we have a Catalan. White can play knight f3 or bishop g2. And this is the main line of the Catalan. So in the Catalan, you play g3, then knight f3. In the Queen's Indian, you play knight f3, and then perhaps g3. So it looks like a Catalan. But in this particular game, he played knight c3 and a3. Of course, if Korshnoi didn't want to face a3, well, then he wouldn't have played the Queen's Indian. But he would have played bishop b4 here if he was really afraid of the variation. And I guess Kasparov was hoping for that because Kasparov didn't play a3 on move four, which he usually did. So eventually they transposed into a position that Kasparov has had a lot of success in. Okay, d5 was played. Cd, knight takes d5. And white can't play e4, which looks like a good move because we trade the knights and the e-pawn isn't defended. Black wins the e-pawn. So white plays e3, g6, and this is Korshnoi's um, preparation for the match. He prepared this g6 line. Check. The pawn goes up blocking the bishop. Korshnoi, uh, uh, Kasparov goes back, and he says, ha-ha, your pawn's on c6 blocking your bishop. I can't believe he said that. Bishop g7. Now he plays e4. It looks like a Grunfeld now. c5. Bishop g5 attacking the queen, queen d6, e5 attacking the queen, queen d7. And after d takes c5, this is where Korshnoi, um, 
this is definitely his preparation because the Queen's Indian was very popular in the 80s and 90s and Kasparov was always playing the A3 line. So this is what Korshnoi prepared for it for the match. And I'm guessing Korshnoi prepared twice because he prepared for the 83 match and Kasparov didn't show up. Then he prepared for the 84 match. Uh, so he prepared for months for this one match and Kasparov probably didn't prepare for the 83 match because Kasparov wasn't going. So Kasparov only prepared for one match. Okay, and in this position, instead of taking on c5, he played the move castles. And I remember when I was a kid in 1983 and this game was played, I was really surprised. Like, black can just give up a pawn? And that was, that was Korshnoi's idea, was he gives up a pawn, but these pawns are all weak. And black has an active rook now. Black has a half-open c-file. Black has great bishops, fianchettoed. And Korshnoi knew he had great compensation for a pawn. And unless you're as old as I am, and you probably aren't, Kasparov was like unbeatable. Kasparov played in tournaments and he won them by three or four points. It was very strange. He now when Magnus plays in a tournament, he usually wins, not always. And when Magnus wins, he wins by half a point or a point. Okay, when Kasparov played, he won every tournament by several points. So it was really weird. Okay, Kasparov dominated. And Korshnoi, of course, in 1983, he's not the Korshnoi from like 1965 to 1975 when he was at his peak. Okay, already in 81, when Korshnoi lost the world championship to Karpov, Korshnoi was already pretty old. So in, 80, in 84, when this game was played, he's way past his prime, but he's Korshnoi. I mean, he's Korshnoi. So, okay, so... Kasparov castled, queen c7, attacking all the weak pawns, bishop b5, he takes the e-pawn, which is, again, an unusual move, but if you, if you take the bishop, your bishops get forked. So he played bishop h6, but this is forking the two, the two bishops that white has. So he played bishop h6, and now the pawn structure clearly favors black. Black has one isolated pawn, and white has two isolated pawns. And if you ask me which bishop was better, well, the, the, the bishop on the long diagonal, not the bishop that's doing virtually nothing. So black is slightly better. And after a very long game, I mean, really long, and you, and you can see that black has a better end game, probably should be a draw, but Korshnoi ended up winning this end game. Okay, and this was shocking. Okay, and we'll just go by quickly. They ended up trading the minor pieces eventually. White can't really do anything. Then knight takes a4 is a good uh, tactical move. If you play bishop takes, I, I play b5 and win your bishop. So he took with the rook. And this rook and pawn ending, black is a pawn up. And he decided not to take the d4 pawn because he wanted a queen. Okay, then he took the d4 pawn. And now black is still a pawn up and white's king is too far away. And good, good endgame technique from black. And after f3, white resigned. Now, this was totally shocking. And I can't, I, I want to give you an analogy so you understand how shocking this was. Imagine uh, Carlson, his first world championship match with Anand, if you remember that. That was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And imagine if Anand won with black the first game. You'd be like, what? Carlson lost with white? Okay, and Anand's five-time world champion. Korshnoi's never been world champion. That's what it felt like. It was like, Kasparov lost with white? Like, everybody thought Kasparov would just mow everybody down and then play Karpov and that it would be the greatest thing ever, which it turned out to be, okay? And... Korshnoi won with black in a Queen's Indian. He played this pawn sacrifice in the Queen's Indian A3 line. He won, and everybody was like, wow. Okay, then that was the end of it. That was it. Then Korshnoi got destroyed. 
So that, that was the only game Korshnoi won. In fact, in slow chess, I'm going to go out on a limb, and then people on YouTube are going to tell me I'm wrong in the comments. I think that's the only slow game Korshnoi ever beat Kasparov. Uh, um, and it was the first game of the match, and we were like, wow. Okay, then, then Korshnoi got run over. Now, it's funny, as Korshnoi was in his 50s, which seems pretty old for a candidate's match. However, the next candidate's match, Kasparov played Smyslov, and Smyslov was 63. So if Smyslov had won his match with Kasparov, Smyslov would have played for the world championship at 63 with Karpov. But Smyslov did not win. In fact, Smyslov didn't win any games. And then Kasparov played Karpov, and the rest is history. They, they played five world championship matches or something. And Kasparov is something like plus three out of 200 games or something like that. So I mean, very, very close, Kasparov and Karpov. Okay, so that Queen's Indian was like the most famous Queen's Indian. Now, I assume Kasparov is going to watch this lecture and be like, Rawr, I'm mad. Fine gold showing games that I lost. All right, Gary, calm down, calm down. Okay, now we're going to show one of my favorite games, and I have a good friend of V. Friedman, who's a chess teacher also, and I've known Aviv for 35 years. And this is a game that he shows at chess camps a lot. Okay, this is the next game. And this way Kasparov won't be mad at me. Okay, this is Kasparov Portish. Uh, also, uh, this game was played a year earlier in 1983 in Yugoslavia. And Kasparov is white. Okay, it should look familiar. It's the same game. Right? Everything's the same. Okay. And he played knight takes c3. Uh, I think uh, Korshnoi played the move bishop e7. And he didn't play knight takes c3 until Kasparov played e4. Okay, so Portish played knight takes c3 and bishop e7. Still bishop b5 check. Bishop d3. And actually, if black had played... Actually, uh, Korshnoi played g6 in that position and Fianchetto his bishop. If Portish had pl played g6, bishop, g7, we could transpose. But Portish didn't do that. And the difference is, without the pawn on g6, white could get an attack against the black king because my bishop is on d3. Also, I don't want to show you four games that black won and say the Queen's Indian wins. I mean, Carlson just lost with black against 2500, so it doesn't win. But I want to show you like both sides so you can see like you saw why it wasn't good last game. Now you're going to see something else. Okay, so he played c5 just like Korshnoi did. Castles, knight c6. And he played bishop b2. And I remember when this game was played, the first time I'd ever seen it, which might have been a year or two later, uh, I was very surprised by this move because it looks like the bishop is behind all these pawns. So why, why is the bishop there? Why isn't Kasparov playing e4 and developing his bishop to like e3? Well, he did in the game against Korshna and he lost. So yeah, the truth hurts. Okay, and this actually reminds me of a game that my dad played against Bobby Fischer in 1963, which was a French defense, different opening. And white had all these pawns uh, on, on the queen's side, like here, here, and here. And he also put his bishop on b2, Fischer did, and eventually the bishop got good, just like in this game. Okay, black played rook c8, white played queen e2, and black castled. So this looks like a very standard kind of position where everybody's developed their minor pieces and castled, and black has pressure against white center, and nobody has an immediate kind of attack or threat. So it seems like it's sort of equal. Okay, but again, before that game with Korshnoi, and that was the only game Korshnoi beat Kasparov, Kasparov was a monster. I mean, he won every game. He beat everybody. It was very strange. He'd play in an 11-round tournament and get like nine and a half. You know, he can give a draw here and there, but not, not too often. Okay, and people were afraid of Kasparov because he was so aggressive and so good at the opening. Okay, so he played rook d1. Now the rook is opposite the queen. So Portish played queen c7. c4. He wants to open up the line for his bishop. 
CD, ED, white has hanging pawns. And so usually we attack hanging pawns. It's risky for black to play G6 because his bishop's on E7. When Korshnoi played G6, his bishop was on G7, which makes more sense. So he played knight A5, attacking the pawn on C4. Black has a lot of pieces attacking the pawn on C4. And if you're not impressed, maybe you're not easily impressed, then black can play bishop A6 and attack the pawn again. And that's why they're called hanging pawns. Sometimes they're hanging. Okay, and then Kasparov said, excuse me while I checkmate you. He actually said that, he said, excuse, very polite. He played the move D5, a very famous move, sacrificing a pawn temporarily to open up his bishops. Okay, well, you, you can't let him take on E6. So he took the pawn. Kasparov won his pawn back with an obvious tactic. Bishop takes, rook takes. And, you know, if black doesn't get checkmated, there's no reason to think that black is worse here. Black's position looks perfectly reasonable. And Portish played King G8 and said, don't checkmate me. Well, King G8, don't, don't play Rook H5 check or Queen H5 check. Okay, and Kasparov said, excuse me, I'm Kasparov. Okay, now if he says he's Kasparov, we just roll on the floor laughing because we don't care. But in 1983, then you got to watch it. And Kasparov played Bishop takes G7. Now, as you all know, except almost none of you know it, in 1984, I went to Moscow and it was part of a chess seminar that FIDE organized for like teenagers all around the world. And the U.S. had two representatives. I was one of them. You've never heard of the other one. The other one is so unknown that if I said his name, he wouldn't even know that it was him. He'd be like, oh, that's right. I went to Moscow. Okay. And we, we were shown this game at the chess seminar, it was three weeks. I was in Moscow for three weeks when I was 14 years old. And relations between the Soviet Union and the US were not good in 84. It was very hard to get a visa, but we had like a US congressman get. Anyway, so uh, they showed me this game and one, and one of the guys who showed it, it might've been Paul Gajewski, I don't know. He said, like white's better by just playing normally but to Kasparov, bishop takes g7 is normal. Like sacking the bishop and mating like 20 moves later after a long king hunt, that's just that's normal for Kasparov. But for a normal person, we would just slowly attack knight e5, queen h5, knight g4. We, we would move our pieces to the king's side and try to attack. But for Kasparov, bishop takes g7 is a normal move. Because you have to take. And then knight e5. So this allows the black queen to come on the diagonal and it also lets white play the move rook d7. So knight e5 is good and black's king doesn't really ever have a safe haven. So it's a long-term peace sacrifice where we just keep attacking the king and Kasparov said, I'm going to attack and you can't defend. You don't have enough defense. Okay, Portish played rook d8, trading rooks, stopping rook d7. Queen g4 check. King goes to f8 and queen f5, threatening queen takes f7 mate. So f6, never play f6. Knight d7 check. And Portish took the knight. If you don't take the knight, then uh, you'll eventually lose because my queen and rook will start attacking you. Uh... For example, like king here loses immediately, so that's just an easy, you know, that's a simple, you, know, you can see that that's risky. And uh, king, well, king f7, uh, I think loses a queen h5 check. And I mean, eventually you're, you're gonna get checkmated by my queen and rook. Um, so he played rook takes d7. And he said, well, my king is safe now. White has almost nothing attacking. So what's, what's the problem with my king? And I have two pieces for a rook. So queen c5, let's trade queens. Obviously, Kasparov didn't trade queens. Played queen h7. Rook c7. Hey, let's trade rooks. And Kasparov said, no, we're not going to trade rooks. Played rook d3. He's going to swing his rook around to g3 and threaten queen g8 mate. 
Obviously, this attack is working because the black knight on a5 is useless. When he played knight a5, he was attacking the c4 pawn. That seems like it was three or four games ago. Like, what, c4 pawn, what are you talking about? But that's where the knight's been sitting. Knight c4, getting his knight back. Rook d1, using both of his rooks. Knight e5, queen h7 check. The king moves up. A funny line would be king f8, and then rook check, and then checkmate. That's why Kasparov got his other rook into the game. Okay, and king e8 is no better. Okay, then the truth hurts. Okay, and whites up a lot of material. Okay, so Portish played king e6, queen g8 check, He's, he, king f5, got to keep going, g4 check, and if you take with the knight, I play rook f3 check, and you can't defend your knight. You're going to have to move your king away from your knight. So king f4, and you might think like, hmm, I remember when Morphy played, this looks like a game Morphy would win because he's playing Doofus. And Doofus walks his king up the board because Morphy's just way better than his opponents. But when you look at games nowadays, like US Championship and the World Championship and, you know, Vikings, Tata Steel, big tournaments, you don't see two super grandmasters playing and one of them has his king on f4 in the middle game getting mated. However, when Kasparov was in top form, you saw that sometimes. Kasparov was mean. Okay, rook d4 check, because black didn't move his king up enough. King f3. Man, the truth hurts. Queen b3 check. Okay, and in this position, black resigned. Uh, king e2, I'm sure hangs several mates in one. I see two off the top of my head. Rook here is mate, and queen e3 is mate. I think there is a third one. I think rook e4 is mate. Oh, no, it's not, because black can play the brilliant queen e3. I didn't see that. Okay, and then the other move is queen c3, and then white can win by playing rook d3 check. E either rook. And a funny line is if you say, wait a minute, black has a rook and a bishop for a queen. Maybe he can hold. Well, you're losing your rook. You got two legal moves, and I can pre-move queen g3 check. That's my pre-move. So if you play king f4 or king takes g4, I check and win your rook. So you can't even do that. So after queen b3 check, black resigned. And I could do a lecture on Portish. Maybe I have. I probably have. And if you look at Portish's games, you won't see his king walking down the board in the middle game getting mated. Unless he's playing Kasparov, then you see that with a lot of guys. So Kasparov was a vicious attacking player, and after winning so many games with A3 in the Queen's Indian, everybody thought when he played Korshnoi, he would just crush him, but he lost that first game, and then that was the only game that he lost. He just played a bad game. It happens. Okay, now he plays a lot of bad games, but truth hurts. Okay, so we're one and one. Okay, the next two games are blitz games. Okay, this is a game a non-played against Laco. Is this a blitz game or a rapid game? No, this is, this, is, this is the World Blitz Championship. And the reason I'm showing this game is I want you to get a flavor of the Queen's Indian, like the different variations. And this is one of the topical variations. Okay, and Laco and Anand, like, you know, in the 1990s and 2000s, they were two of the top theoreticians. So they're going to play a ton of theory. And Laco used to play the Queen's Indian. Okay, G3 is the most common move. And in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, everybody played Bishop B7. And if you see a game with Bishop B7, it was probably played 40, 50, 60 years ago. Then in the 80s and 90s, people started playing Bishop A6, and that became more popular. Attacking the pawn on c4. b3, defending the pawn. Bishop b4 check. And then back to e7, so white can't fianchetto his bishop. And if white plays bishop c3, 
then the white knight can't go to c3. So that's the point of that bishop b4 to e7. Bishop g2, c6, bishop c3. And this is, there's a lot of games played in the 1990s and 2000s that went exactly this way. Exactly. Okay, castles, rook c8, e4, and then c5. And so the question is, who's better prepared, Anand or Laiko? Typically, if you asked me that question, I would say it's about equal, because both really well prepared. And what some of you don't know is Laiko almost became world champion. Laiko was playing Kramnik for the world championship. Laiko was up one point with one game to go. And unfortunately for him, Kramnik won, and Kramnik was the reigning champ, so he kept his title. That was the rule then. So Laiko playing a world championship match obviously has a lot of good preparation. Okay, takes, takes. And this position looks very similar. The pawn structure is almost the same. And Anand got the smallest of advantages. Even the C6 is theory. Everything's theory. Takes, takes. And even this position might be theory. And you might say, wait a minute, black's better. Black has a better pawn structure. But then you have to realize these are grandmasters and grandmasters like the two bishops. So white has two bishops and a worse pawn structure. Laco thought, I can draw this because the c4 pawn is so weak. And Anand thought, I can win this because I have the two bishops. Now what's funny is this is a blitz game, but it looks like it's a slow game because both sides play so well. And Anand in the 1980s and 1990s was unbeatable in blitz. He, and he's so good at blitz that in the early 2000s, Nakamura told me that he had a match with Kasparov set up with a $100,000 prize in blitz chess and Kasparov refused to play him. And I said to Nakamura, you have chances to win that match. And Nakamura responded in Nakamura style. He said, no, no, I would beat Kasparov in a blitz match, which, you know, that's Nakamura style. Then he followed it up with a non-Nakamura remark, even though he's Nakamura. And he said, but I would lose to Anand. And I was taken aback. Okay, that's, that's, that's how good Anand was. Nakamura said he'd lose to Anand in blitz. Now that, but, but that he'd beat Kasparov. So that's, that was his, okay. So this is a blitz game, but Anand plays like perfect the whole game. So very strange. Okay, Anand plays rook d7. That looks pretty good. Now white has an obvious threat. Bishop takes knight and the bishop's hanging on e7. So Laco played bishop f6. He said, you have two bishops. Now you don't have two bishops. So they traded. And even though black has a weakened pawn structure, you, you can't take those pawns. And this pawn looks nice and juicy. So Anand played the relatively obvious bishop d5 because the bishop is great on d5 and he's defending his pawn. Knight b4 takes and they went into the double rook ending, which Laco thought he could draw because there's very few pawns on the board, but he was wrong. Truth hurts. Anand played rook b2. Now Anand's going to push his a pawn and he does. Black stops the a pawn and unfortunately Anand plays the brilliant move f4. Okay, and you say, why is that brilliant? Okay, if white plays the obvious move, rook b7, that looks pretty good. B Black plays rook a2 and, and does the same thing that white's doing and attacks this pawn. So Anand plays f4 and now Anand has the unstoppable rook bb7 taking everything and his king just hides. Rook a2 doesn't pin the pawn, the pawn's not on f2 anymore. So that's what happened. And Anand won some pawns, put his, made his king safe, traded rooks, and the h pawn is indefensible. So, for example, if you play rook takes pawn here, uh, I can play rook here, or I could play uh, rook c5. And if you play f5, you can never defend your pawn. I play rook here and rook h6, and I can take your pawn or I could play king h4 and win. So he played the move 
instead of playing rook takes pawn, he played h4, hoping Anand would mess up his pawn structure, but Anand took with the king. And in this position, black resigned because black can't save his f pawn, and Anand's going to have two pawns to zero. And when I played that game over, I noticed afterwards it was a blitz game, and I'm like, Anand plays better in blitz chess than like anybody does anything. Like that could have been a world championship game. Anand was like slightly better than clearly better than one, and they both played like 20 moves of prep. Okay, so they both knew the opening really well, but Anand was five time world champion, and Laco never won the world championship, and now you can see why. Anand was better. Okay, and Anand's not known to be an endgame player, but that doesn't mean he can't play perfect in the endgame. See, if you want to be known as a good endgame player, you got to play better than perfect. Anand only played perfect, so that's, you know, that's no good. Okay, and the next game, and the last game of the lecture, is also a blitz game. Okay, and this is the game, Carlson, who did he beat up on? Bartosz Szaczko. Okay, and Sachko is a Polish grandmaster, and his wife is also a Polish grandmaster. And let me rephrase that. His wife isn't a WGM, she's a GM. Okay, so she's probably more famous than he is, although he's over 2,600 feet. Okay, and this is Carlson's white. So this makes up for what I did last week when I made a video showing Carlson losing with the Queen's Indian. Now I'll show you a game he wins with the King's Queen's Indian, although he is white. Okay, b6, g3, bishop b7. And I wanted to show two examples, one of bishop a6 and one of bishop b7. Bishop a6 was a non laico and this is bishop b7. Bishop g2, c5, and a lot of people don't play c5 immediately because of what Carlson did. And typically in this position, more common moves are bishop e7 or bishop b4 check. And if you can successfully play c5, which Carlson did last week, he played c5 and ended up taking on d4, then that's fine for black. However, you can't take on d4 because Carlson plays the pawn sacrifice d5. And after takes, typically white used to play the move knight h4, pinning the pawn to the bishop. And then black could either play g6 and fianchetto his bishop and try to make it look like a, a Benoni, or he could play the move b5 and say, which pawn are you taking? And I'm going to have some, a nice pawn structure for black. Like if you take this, I'll go here, and black has some nice pawns up here. Okay, but Carlson didn't do that. After ED, he just took back. He said, go, go take the pawn, be my guest. So Sachko took the pawn. And white gets a lot of development. So instead of playing bishop b7, and then white would probably play bishop g5 and e4 and e5 and knight b5 to d6, all kinds of counterplay, he took the knight on f3 and played knight c6. So black is like, I'm up a pawn, I'm going to play bishop e7 in castle, I don't see the compensation. White has the two bishops. So, okay, bishop f4, bishop e7. Castles, castles, and this is a typical Queen's Indian position where white is sacrificed a pawn and has good compensation. And these are the kinds of games in the 1980s that Kasparov was winning a lot with white. These kinds of pawn sacrifice positions where white has more space. Played the move e3, he wasn't in a big hurry, and black played knight e8. Uh, Black wants to put the bishop on f6, probably, on a nice diagonal. h4, put it in h. Also, Black might be threatening to move g5, winning a piece. That could be annoying. That bishop is trapped. So h4, h6, threatening g5 again. h5, now you can't play g5 because I take on Passant. Knight c7, the knight's coming to e6, that's a good square. Queen a4, the knight does come to e6, rook to d1. And even though black is a pawn up, it's a pretty bad pawn. It can't ever go to d5 because white's attacking d5 like 400 times. So that pawn's sort of weak. You can't move the pawn anyway. Even if you could move the pawn, you'd lose your knight. So you don't have a good place to put it and you lose your knight. So rook c8, 
knight to d5, that's a nice square. Knight takes, and he takes with the g pawn because Magnus wants to use the g file and start an attack on the king. Also, he wants to stop black from playing knight e5 and knight d4. Those are the two good squares for the knight, and white put his pawns on e3 and f4. Rook e8, king g2, bishop f8, always play bishop f8. Rook g1, knight e7. And knight e7 is a blunder um, in a tough position. I mean, black is very passive here. It's very hard to make a move for black. White could just play king f1 next move, getting his rook on the open g line, and white basically controls the whole board. Black can't move any of his minor pieces to better squares. Although, I said that, but Sachko said, I'll move my knight here and trade off the knights. Okay, and Magnus Carlsen said, excuse me, I'm Magnus Carlsen. I'm the world chess champion. He can't say that now, but during this game he could say it. And even though this was a blitz game, Carlson played the brilliant move, knight f6 check. Not because he's opening the g line, because the queen is trapped. g takes f6, rook takes d7. Now it's possible Sachko saw this and he was planning the move b5. It's also possible he didn't see it, I don't know. And after b5, the queen has the b6 square, so it looks like uh, black is going to escape and be up a piece. Queen takes a7. Now you don't have the b6 square. So either he saw this and thought b5 saved him and missed queen takes a7, or he didn't see knight f6 and rook takes d7. We'll never know. It's a blitz game. I'm going to say that he missed it. Okay, he tried with rook a8 because his queen's trapped, but trying is the first step to failure. And now Magnus just simply takes the queen. And if Sachko takes this queen, then you lose your rook on e8 and whites up the exchange. And plus white's threatening to move his king with discovered check, which actually wins the bishop. I don't see a defense to that. Maybe I'm not good enough. Okay, I see a defense now. I could play knight f5, king check, knight g7. Then all my pieces are pinned and I'm down the exchange in a pawn. That's the most fun you can have. Okay, so instead of doing that, after rook takes queen on d8, black resigned. So you can see, and one of my goals of this lecture was to show you all the best players in the world played both sides of the Queen's Indian. They played it with white and black. It was very popular in the 80s and 90s. Now it's less popular because most people on move three at the top level are playing d5 on move three. So if we go back to the beginning, not, to, not the beginning beginning, but in this position, if you look at a game between the two, two of the top 20, 30, 40 players in the world, it's very likely black's going to play d5 here. Very likely. Then white can play a Catalan, or we can play a, a Ragozin system, and could be a Vienna. And b6, which was the most popular move by far in the 80s and 90s, is now second to d5, but the people still play it, nothing wrong with it, and it leads to very interesting positions. The obvious reason to play b6 is you want to get your bishop out, and it doesn't look like your bishop's going to get out this way. So b6, bishop b7, or bishop a6 makes, makes a lot of sense. So that was the lecture on the Queen's Indian if you go to databases anywhere, chess base, lead chess, chess.com, you'll see lots of Queen's Indians. And uh, if you want to play the Queen's Indian, there's a lot of books on it because it was a very popular opening. And if you're black and you like the Queen's Indian, you're going to surprise a lot of your opponents because they're probably expecting the Nimzo Indian and the Queen's Gambit declined, Queen's Gambit accepted. Those are more common openings now than the Queen's Indian. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. I want to thank you for watching the lecture. I want to thank Patrick Wheeler, who's our sponsor. If you'd like to sponsor a stream, contact my wife, Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com, and you can sponsor a lecture on the subject of your choosing. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Bye.